I grew up on a steady diet of science fiction. In high school, I, I took a bus to school an hour each way, every day, and uh, I was always absorbed in a book, science fiction book, which took my mind to other worlds and satisfied this, uh, in, in, a, in a narrative form, this insatiable sense of curiosity that I had. And, and uh, you know, that curiosity also manifested itself in, in um, the fact that whenever I wasn't in school, I was, I was out in the woods hiking and taking samples, uh, frogs and snakes and bugs and pond water and bringing it back, looking at it under the microscope. I was, you know, I was a real science geek, but it was all about trying to understand, understand the world, understand the, the limits of, of possibility. And my, you know, love of, of science fiction actually seemed to be mirrored in the world around me because what was happening, this was in the late 60s, uh, you know, we were, we were going to the moon. We were exploring the deep oceans. Uh, Jacques Cousteau was coming into our living rooms with his amazing specials that showed us animals and places and you know, a wondrous world that we could never really have previously imagined. So that seemed to resonate with the whole science fiction part of it. And I was uh, an artist. Uh, I could draw, I could paint, and, and I, I found that because there weren't, you know, video games and this saturation of CG movies and, and all of this imagery in the media landscape, I had to create these images in my head. You know, we all did as kids having to uh, read a book and through the author's description, put something on the, on the screen, uh, the movie screen in our heads. And so my response to this was to paint, to draw alien creatures, alien worlds, robots, spaceships, all that stuff. I was endlessly getting busted in math class, you know, doodling behind the, behind the textbook. And that was, uh, the creativity had to, had to find its outlet somehow. And an interesting thing happened. The, the Jacques Cousteau shows uh, actually got me very excited about the fact that there was an alien world right here on Earth. I might not really go to an alien world, uh, on a spaceship someday. Uh, that, that seemed pretty, un, pretty darn unlikely. But I could, that was a world I could really go to right here on Earth that was as, as rich and exotic as anything that I had imagined uh, from reading these books. So uh, I decided I was going to become a scuba diver at the age of 15. And the only problem with that was that I lived in a little village in Canada, 600 miles from the nearest ocean. But I didn't let that daunt me. Uh, I pestered my father until he finally found a, a scuba class in, in uh, Buffalo, New York, right across the border from where we live. And I actually got certified uh, in a pool at a YMCA in the dead of winter in Buffalo, New York. And I didn't see the ocean, uh, a real ocean, for another two years until we, until we moved to California. And now since then, you know, in the, in the, in the intervening 40 years, uh, I've, I've spent about 3,000 hours underwater, and 500 hours of that was in submersibles. And I've learned that that, that, that deep ocean environment and even the shallow oceans are so uh, rich uh, with, uh, with amazing life that really is beyond, beyond our imagination. You know, nature's imagination is so, so boundless compared to our own uh, meager human imagination. I still, to this day, stand in absolute awe of what I, what I see when I make these dives, and my love affair with the ocean is, is ongoing and, and just as strong as it ever was. But uh, when, I, when I chose a career as an adult, uh, it was filmmaking, and that seemed to be the best way to reconcile this urge I had to tell stories with my, my urges to uh, create images. And I was, as a kid, constantly drawing comic books and so on. So filmmaking was the way to put, put pictures and stories together, and that made sense. And of course, the stories that I chose to tell were science fiction stories, Terminator, Aliens, and then The Abyss. And with The Abyss, uh, I, I was putting together my love of underwater and diving with filmmaking. So, you know, merging the two passions. Something interesting came out of the abyss, which was that to solve a specific narrative problem on that film, which was to create this kind of liquid water creature, um, we actually embraced 
uh, computer-generated uh, animation, uh, CG. And this, uh, this resulted in the first soft surface character CG animation that was ever in a, in a movie. And even though the film didn't make any money, uh, barely broke even, I should say, I witnessed something amazing, which is that the, the audience, the global audience, was mesmerized by this apparent magic. You know, it's Arthur Clarke's law that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. They were seeing something magical. And so that, that, that got me very excited, and I thought, wow, this is, this is something that needs to be embraced into the cinematic art. So with uh, Terminator 2, which was my next film, we took that much farther. Working with, with ILM, we created the liquid metal dude in that film, and the success hung in the balance on whether that effect would work, and it did, and we created magic again, and we had the same result um, with an audience, although we did make a little more money on that one. Uh, so. You know, drawing a line through those, those two, two dots of, ex, of experience came to this, this is going to be a whole new world. This is a whole new world of creativity for, for film artists. So I, I started a company with Stan Winston, my good friend Stan Winston, who is a, the, the premier makeup and, and creature designer uh, at that time, and it was called Digital Domain. And the concept of the company was that we would leapfrog past the kind of analog processes of, of optical printers and so on, and we would go right to digital production. And we actually did that, and it gave us a competitive advantage for a while. But we found ourselves lagging in the, in the mid-90s in the creature and character design stuff that we had actually founded the company to do. So I wrote this piece called Avatar, which was meant to absolutely push the envelope of uh, visual effects, of CG effects, beyond with realistic uh, human emotive uh, characters generated in CG and the main characters would all be in CG and the world would be in CG. And, um, you know, the, the envelope pushed back and I was told by uh, the, the folks at my company that we weren't going to be able to do this for a while. So I shelved it and I made this other movie about a big ship that sinks. <laughs> and, you know, I, I went and pitched it to the studio as Romeo and Juliet on a ship. It's going to be this epic romance, passionate film. Secretly, what I wanted to do was I wanted to dive to the real wreck of Titanic, and that's why I made the movie. <laughs> and that's the truth. Now, the studio didn't know that, but I convinced them. I said, I said, we're going to dive to the wreck. We're going to film it for real. We'll be using it in the opening of the film. It'll be really important. It'll be a great marketing hook. And I talked them into funding an expedition. <laughs> Sounds crazy. But this goes back to that theme about, you know, your imagination creating a reality. Because it actually created a reality where six months later, I found myself in a Russian submersible two and a half miles down in the North Atlantic looking at the real Titanic through, through a viewport. Not a movie, not HD, for real. Now, that, that blew my mind, and, you know, it took a lot of preparation. We had to build cameras and lights and all kinds of things, but it struck me how much this dive, these deep dives, was like a, like a space mission, you know, where it was, it was highly technical and uh, it required enormous planning, and you get in this capsule, you go down to this dark, hostile uh, environment where there's no hope of rescue if you can't get back by yourself. And, you know, I, I thought, wow, I'm, I'm like living in a science fiction movie. This is really cool. And so I, I really got bitten by the bug of deep ocean exploration. Of course, the curiosity, the science component of it, it was everything. It was adventure, it was curiosity, it was imagination, and it was an experience that Hollywood couldn't give me. Because, you know, I could imagine a creature and we could create a visual effect for it, but I couldn't imagine what I was seeing out that window. As we did some of our subsequent expeditions, I was seeing creatures at hydrothermal vents and, and sometimes uh, things that I ha had never seen before, sometimes things that no one had seen before that actually were not described by science at the time that we saw them and imaged them. So I was completely smitten by this and had to do more. And so I actually made a kind of curious decision. After the success of Titanic, I said, okay, you know, I'm going to park my day job as a Hollywood movie maker, and I'm going to go be a full-time explorer for a while. And so, you know, we started planning these, these expeditions, and 
We wound up going to the Bismarck and, and exploring it with, uh, with uh, robotic vehicles. We went back to the Titanic wreck. We took little bots that we had created that sp spooled a fiber optic, and the idea was to go in and do an interior survey of that ship, uh, which had never been done. Nobody had ever looked inside the wreck. They didn't have the means to do it, so we created technology to do it. So, you know, here I am now on the deck of Titanic, sitting in a submersible and looking out at planks that look much like this, where I knew that the, that the band had played, and I'm flying a little robotic vehicle through the, through the corridor of the, uh, of the ship. You know, when I say, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm operating it, but my mind is in the vehicle. I felt like I was physically present inside the shipwreck of Titanic, and it was a, the most surreal kind of deja vu experience I've, I've ever had because I would know before I turned a corner what was going to be there before the lights of the vehicle actually revealed it because I had walked the set for months when we were making the movie. And the set was based as an exact replica on the blueprints of the ship. So it was this absolutely remarkable experience and it really made me realize that you know, tel the telepresence experience, that you actually can have these robotic avatars, then your consciousness is, is in, injected into the, into the vehicle, into this, this other form of existence. And it was really, really quite profound. And uh, maybe a little bit of a glimpse to, to what might be happening, you know, some decades out as, uh, as we start to have uh, cyborg bodies for exploration or for other means in, in many sort of um, post-human futures that I, that I can imagine as a science fiction fan. So having done these, these um, uh, expeditions, uh, and, and, you know, really beginning to appreciate what was down there, such as at the, at the, the deep ocean vents where we had these amazing, amazing animals. They're ba basically aliens right here on Earth. They live in a, an environment of chemosynthesis. They don't survive on sunlight-based system the way we do. And so you're seeing animals that are living next to 500-degree centigrade water plumes that, that you think they can't possibly exist. At the same time, I was getting very interested in space science as well. Again, you know, it's the science fiction influence as a kid. And I wound up getting involved with uh, the space community, really involved with, uh, with NASA, sitting on the NASA advisory board, planning uh, actual space missions, going to Russia, going through the pre-cosmonaut biomedical protocols and all these sorts of things to actually go and fly to the International Space Station with our 3D camera systems. And this was fascinating, but what, what I wound up doing was bringing space scientists with us into the deep and taking them down so that they had access, astrobiologists, planetary scientists, people who were interested in these extremophile environments, taking them down to the vents and letting them see and take samples and test instruments and so on. So here we were making documentary films, but actually doing science and actually doing space science. I had completely closed the loop between being the science fiction fan, you know, as a kid, and doing this stuff for real. And, you know, along the way, in this journey of discovery, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about science, but I also learned a lot about leadership. Now you think director's got to be a leader, leader of, you know, captain of the ship, all that sort of thing. I didn't really learn about leadership until I did these expeditions because I had to, at a certain point, say, what am I doing out here? Why am I doing this? What do I get out of it? We don't make money at these damn shows. You know, we barely break even. There's no fame in it. People sort of think I went away between Titanic and Avatar and was buffing my nails someplace, you know, sitting at the beach. Made all these films, made all these documentary films that, you know, for a very limited audience. So no fame, no glory, no money. What are you doing? You're doing it for the task itself, for the challenge, and the ocean is the most challenging environment there is, for the thrill of discovery, and for that strange bond that happens when a small group of people form a tightly knit team, because we would do these things with 10, 12 people working for years at a time, sometimes at sea for, for, for two, three months at a time. And in that bond, you realize that the most important thing is the respect that you have for them and that they have for you, that you've done a task that you can't explain to someone else. When you come back to the shore and you say, well, you know, we had to do this and the fiber optic and the attenuation and the this and that, all the, all the technology of it and the difficulty, the human performance aspects of working at sea, 
You can't explain it to people. It's that thing that, that maybe cops have or people in, in combat that have gone through something together and they know they can never explain it. Creates a bond, creates a bond of respect. So when I came back to make my next movie, which was Avatar, I tried to apply that same principle of leadership, which is that it, you respect your team and you earn their respect in return. And it, it really changed the dynamic. So here I was again with a small team and, you know, in uncharted territory, doing Avatar, coming up with new technology that didn't exist before, tremendously exciting, um, tremendously challenging, and we became a family over a four and a half year period, and it completely changed how I do movies. So people have commented on how, you know, well, you brought back the ocean uh, organisms and put them on the planet of Pandora. To me, it was more of a fundamental way of doing business, the process itself that changed as a result of that. So what can we synthesize out of all this? You know, what's the, what are the lessons learned? Well, I think number one is curiosity. It's the most powerful thing you own. Imagination is a force that can actually manifest a reality. And the respect of your team is more important than all the laurels in the world. I have young filmmakers come up to me and say, you know, give me some advice for doing this. And I say, don't put limitations on yourself. Other people will do that for you. Don't do it to yourself. Don't bet against yourself. And, and take risks. Uh, NASA has this, has this uh, phrase that they like, failure is not an option. But failure has to be an option in art and in exploration because it's a leap of faith. And no important endeavor that required innovation was done without risk. You have to be willing to take those risks. So that's the thought I would leave you with, is that in whatever you're doing, failure is an option, but fear is not. Thank you.